Hari Hari Rama Hari Rama Rama Rama. Rama. A body wasn't made to last. A soul is. Well, it was the year 1965 when the 70 years old Hindu, His Divine Grace Swami Prabhupada, arrived in America to spread the message of Krishna consciousness. And later, when he arrived in the UK, that same Krishna consciousness had attracted the attention of one Beatle, George Harrison. And so strong was the attraction that George became part of the movement. Look, this is Eddie Kelly. This is an earlier Mark I version of Eddie Kelly. Still Eddie Kelly, an older model. Confused? Don't be. Eddie Kelly was the same person in all three bodies and has been and will be in all of these until he goes to the spiritual sky. Phew. What a life. Um, lives. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Radha Madhava Don't get ripped off in the rat race for material success. Try Krishna consciousness. I got involved in Krishna consciousness when I was 16, when I was a runaway living in Amsterdam. The main points of Krishna consciousness that were attractive to me were the idea of karma, that uh, the soul is the real you and the body is like a, a car that you're driving for this particular life and if you can get through your set of circumstances i.e. rise above your karma then the chances are you may not have to come back to this um, particular planet and I don't really, uh, I'm not so attached to living as, as a human being forever on earth um, to be uh, pulled in by the laws of nature that we live by, which is birth, death, these old age. And your real nature is that you're spiritual and that you have the ability to go back to heaven, to um, the spiritual realm, whatever anybody wants to call it, but to hang out with God. Now, whether that's Jehovah, God, Allah, or Krishna, um, they're all names of God. And maybe if people just remembered the names of God sincerely, uh, the world could change a whole notch around. And maybe if people stopped killing all the animals to satisfy their tongue, it could change a bit more. I was brought up uh, in an average Western school educational system. Mm -hmm. But my uncle, when I was about seven, he was a member of the Hare Krishna movement, I went to visit him at the temple. So I never, in one sense, I never understood it to be a strange thing or unusual thing for someone to get involved with because it was something I had experienced of. So academically I was, you know, quite gifted. I used to do quite well at school. Uh, but at the same time I became more interested in the social scene that was there. And 
gave up the idea of pursuing material goals. I used to spend a lot of time visiting my uncle on his farm in Wales, living a very simple, wholesome life. And the qualities he had as a person and the way he approached life attracted me to adopting the kind of values he had rather than the materialistic way of life. Mm -hmm. I used to start, at that time I started visiting the temples, I became vegetarian, right. etc. Can I ask you um, what your name means and why you changed it from, was it Dominic, do you recall? Yeah, I was called Dominic at birth. So the name I receive at birth is, especially Dominic's a Catholic name, so most Catholic names are given as one of the saints' names. Yes. And all the names within our movement are names of Krishna or one of Krishna's devotees with Das added. Das means servant. So my name Damodar Das. Damodar is a name of Krishna, which means one who is bound with ropes of affection to his devotees. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Das means servant, so I'm servant of Damodar. Sorry, surely a name is a very superficial thing and you shouldn't have to change it just to please no, Krishna. But my, but my name now as Damodar Das reminds me of my actual identity. The material name no longer has any great relevance to who so we are. So Dominic as a Catholic name was a material name and well, Damodar no longer, as a Christian no name really is it? No, it doesn't actually bear any real resemblance or any real purpose reminding me who I am. But if I identify myself as Damodar Das, reminding myself always that I'm a servant of Krishna, the same with the way we dress and saffron robes, devotees of Krishna, well, shave you say, hair. You say you do this for Krishna. Um, you say you do this for the, the sake of the spiritual life. Uh, I think you said that. But I mean, what I see is someone who's dressed very much in an, Indi an Indian way, yes. who's accepted an Indian culture. Mm. And uh, you, you say you're very gifted at school. I wonder if you feel you've had to reject the ways of thinking you learned at school, the Western ways of thinking, which, which are frankly uh, what I value most. And, and um, and whether you've just adopted an alien culture. People in the spiritual world dress like this. Well, now, in India, because the spiritual culture was implanted in India, in that particular continent which we now call India, then we accept it to be Indian because that's our frame of reference. But actually, the details are there in the scriptures that this is how one dresses in the spiritual world. To me, to be a spiritual person, spirituality is what's on the inside, and I cannot see the relevance, yes. but I cannot see the relevance of dressing yourself up in a uniform, a club uniform. Uh, that, that really gets a, does, a, state, a statement. People in the spiritual world dress like this seems to belay the whole idea which I have of, of the spiritual world. I mean, how do you know people in the spiritual world dress at all? How do you know anything about anything? Yeah, well, how, that's another thing. How do you know anything about anything? You, you accept it from authority. Like, when you come into this world, you know absolutely nothing. I'm sorry, you I, don't I, even I'm going to ask you a question. You, you only know what you accept from authority. Mm -hmm. From what so authority? can't you no. trust your own experience? So what's that experience? That's the authority of your senses. Your eyes are giving you some information, your ears are giving you some information, and you accept those to be good objects of information. But the eyes are faulty, the nose is faulty, the ears are faulty. And your the, the scriptures are faulty as no. well. The scriptures, the scriptures are not are, the scriptures are a physical thing. I mean, they're, they're written by men who make mistakes. Uh, you're presuming that they're written by men. We don't accept that they're written by men. Well, can you give us a bit more sort of backing for your claim that your scriptures are supernaturally? Are they perfect? Are they infallible? Yeah. How did, how did that happen? How did that happen? Because God himself, desiring the living entity's uh, liberation from entanglement in this world, reveals the scriptures through empowered living entities. The practical problem is that there, there are so many people like yourself in so many religious groups claiming so much the same thing what and you I all that you that if we look for ourselves we will find and we have to test it for ourselves but how on earth and real people who have to go to work bring up their kids gonna have the time to search their way through the Vedic scriptures through the Quran through the Bible through Joe uh, this material body I mean, there's so is, many this of material body is compared out? to a machine this material body is compared to a machine. So a machine needs a certain amount of maintenance. But it doesn't mean that, just like a man has a car. So he has a certain duty to the car, he wants to maintain the car. But if a man spends all day looking after the car, mm -hmm. cleaning it nicely, putting fuel in the car, 
uh, making a nice arrangement for the car, and forgets to feed himself, to dress himself, well, to clean that's himself. That's a wonderful metaphor. I don't understand it. The yeah. question yeah. is, the question, soul. what I'm saying, what I'm saying is how do ordinary people in the real world find out the truth about your religion as compared to the truth of another religion, all of which to them are claiming very much the same things. Now give them some specific practical advice, please. So the point is... Right, give the answer, please. So there may be so many different travel agencies. Now, first of all, one has to have the desire to travel. Mm -hmm. Now, if someone's completely content with material life, they'll never have any impetus right. to look for spiritual right. uh, enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Given that someone does have a, a little disillusion with this material world and mm -hmm. wants to inquire into the nature of the truth, right. then there are different people who are offering different paths or different solutions. It's just like different travel agencies may offer different resorts. So on the basis of that, how much information can you receive uh, uh, from one travel agency about the place you will be staying, about the nature of the uh, people there, about what type of activities go on there? Mm. Like mm -hmm. the spiritual world, most, most descriptions of the spiritual world are very vague. But within Krishna consciousness there are very uh, vast descriptions of what it's like in the spiritual world, very detailed descriptions. Krishna is the Supreme Lord. Every living entity has an eternal relationship with him. But presently, we've fallen into the material atmosphere and are living in forgetfulness. When one revives his original God consciousness, whatever sect or whatever culture he wants to follow, doesn't matter. If he revives his original God consciousness and gives up his false conception of himself as the enjoyer... Are they Krishna concepts of false consciousness? That's okay. what I mean, when you say give up the, the false concepts, whatever, which, what can be more specific about those things which we are meant to forget? Because if they're different from those things which are taught in other religions, then it does matter whether we're following the basic the illusion, or not. The basic illusion that every conditioned living being is in in this world is that I am this body. I am black, I am white, I am American, I am Russian, I am old, I am young, I am a dog, I am a cat. Well, that is important, isn't it? Would is it, it matter? Important? Would it matter? Well, the needs, I, I, you, you talked about... Um, you said you're not married, but um, would you like to get married? Probably in the future I will get married. Because, um, as I understand it, the, the, uh, the lifestyle involves having sex once a month. I mean, it, it's a very Within kind marriage, of... Um, it, and, and, of children. <laughs> um, solely for the pro propagation of children or whatever it is. And um, so really, you, you're, you're putting a very low uh, importance upon the sex you'll drive. You, is that, is that right? Sex is the binding factor of this material world. On the basis of sex life, people become entangled with each other. What's the binding factor? Well, okay. okay. so, so you're saying that's not very sex. important. No, but what we're saying is... practical? No, I mean, we're not saying... You re, you, you, you we're not saying very, it's very, very important. We're saying, okay, we're saying it's very significant because on the basis of that sexual attraction, the living entity becomes bound to this material world. On the basis so of that sexual attraction, attraction there is sexuality. It's not a case of denying a sexuality, but we don't become slaves to it. Are you saying it's unnatural? Sex drive is there, but human life is meant for controlling it. Is meant for controlling it. We can see what the results in the world are of uncontrolled sex life. I mean, I can't... Can you tell me, just so I've got this right, in, within marriage, sex once a month. And only for procreation. And only for procreation. <laughs> I You're I'm smiling because you marriage. know this is weird. I'm, no, I'm not smiling because I know it's weird. Well, why you think it's smiling? weird because you've been brought up with a certain, no, a certain no. set of values. So no. therefore you accept that I'm completely normal. I'm completely are. normal. And whatever I believe is perfectly you? true. And if someone thinks something different, that's weird. Are you saying? No. That's your no. idea. That is that's Idea. That is not at all. So Are you saying, saying that Krishna is actually advocating that you should give up both the pleasures of the material world in, t in terms of conveniences and comforts and also the pleasures of the natural world that he's offered you? This, this world, that your body is natural. World, There's nothing about it that you should be ashamed of. This world, this body is not natural for the soul to live in. The it's soul. The it's the body oh, that on, God created for the soul, you. The soul is hankering for eternity. The soul is hankering for bliss the soul, and knowledge. The soul, the soul, that's yes. all we hear. What about the body? Well, so the body has certain, certain needs. But one doesn't have to just cater They're to... Natural. Do we want to be servants I of the body? Or do we want to be so masters the of the body? So the soul is sound. Are you dressed like that? And your hairstyle is quite unusual with a pigtail. And you've mm. got ash on your forehead. It's not ash. This is, clay, this is clay from the bank of the Ganges. Actually the bank of the Jamuna River, which is a sacred river in India, where Krishna performs his pastimes. So, by taking this clay on our foreheads, it's, um, 
reminding us constantly that we're devotees of Krishna by adopting this dress because we're adopting the dress of a devotee of Krishna Put then the everything we do is meant to provoke remembrance of Krishna according to how we live our life according to uh, the activities we perform then we remember or we have a certain type of awareness consciousness so if at the time of death when death comes that's one thing we can guarantee is coming I don't think anyone's got any arguments on that um, then because our consciousness is fixed on Krishna then that's where we go if one's consciousness is constantly dovetailed towards this material body then he'll get another material body if one's always meditating on sex life then he'll get a body which is appropriate for someone who wants to enjoy sex but it sounds like if he wants, then one's always med where, you know I don't really understand why you need signs to help you remember your beliefs. Why does the Surely... policeman wear a uniform? Well, oh, I can so tell you why the policeman no. wears a uniform. But I don't like uniforms. No, I mean, but why does the policeman wear a uniform? So that we can tell who he is and what yeah, he's about. Yeah, so if someone needs help, they know where to go. Mm. Can, I ask you, you know? can I ask you about your approach to people, the way you approach people in the street? For instance, your uh, method of selling, which I think is a tiny bit uh, akin to trickery. You know, you say, here's a free gift from God, and then a minute later, and this has happened to me, you say, uh, one pound fifty, please. And it's, mm. that's a little at odds with your thinking. I, I would find it very difficult to trust anybody who would come up to me and then first of all say, here's a gift, and secondly say, give me money for the gift. It seems to me, well, from the very outset, you're being conned. Mm. Mm. So if, if people have used those type of techniques, I would say that they're not really understanding what a devotee is doing when he's representing the Krishna conscious movement on the street. Do you not, well, do you not believe well, can, I, can I explain, first of all, what the activity of book distribution is all about? Srila Prabhupada, uh, the founder of our movement, he very much stressed this book distribution as a very good way of um, injecting spiritual teachings in society as a whole. And he very much wanted us to distribute his books so that is the foremost reason why we're there. Now, collecting funds, a lot of people have this idea that we're uh, very much interested in gaining a lot of funds. And yes, we are. So what to do spread you... Krishna's, to spread Krishna's movement. Now... So what do you do with the money? And that's what I'm saying. Uh, people have this idea because generally money is used to make some nice material facility to enjoy life. But let, if you come and visit the temples and see how the individual devotee lives in the temple, from the temple president down to the pot so, washer. So where does the money go to then? It's what used to print more books, it's used to run free lunch programs for which people are invited to attend, to uh, worship the Supreme Lord, which is for the benefit of all people. So uh, aren't the followers of Hare Krishna moving into the materialistic world by why? doing all these things? Why? Krishna, Krishna is the Lord of everything. The material world is also his kingdom. If one can utilize this world for the pleasure of the Lord, then that's real renunciation. It's not that renunciation means to go into a forest and meditate and n why, wear no why, clothes. Why, why, why go to an Ishrath and sit there and meditate and, all, and do all this thing in this idyllic setting? Why do that whenever you can all, you're also making use of the, of the, of the machinery of the socio-economic structure? Hmm. You know, why, why do that? It, seem, it seems to me to be very contradictory that, first of all, you're, you're making use of, of, a, of a great machine, the, the, whole, the whole social enterprise. And then, on the other hand, you're, you're turning your back on that and going to Anishrath or going to any temples in these places and, and totally denouncing that. It, it seems to me, ideally, I, please explain that. Ideally, we would prefer to live in such places as Anishrath because we're trying to minimize our contact with the cities which are dens of illusion. But, but, because we have a preaching spirit, we go to such places for the benefit of the people there to enlighten them about spiritual life. Just as Jesus, he said, it's the uh, physician should go to the sick. So in, for preaching purpose, we have places and cities, but otherwise, ideally, we prefer to live in the country. Surely you should be stuck here. If you're a religious person, if you care about your fellow human beings, why don't you get in there and do a bit of charity work for we people? Do. Yeah, but you, you but seem we so recognize the limitations. with... Can, getting them to be Krishna conscious. You mm -hmm. get in there... What's put, the point of saving there. the drowning man's coat? Oh, if, God! And, I mean, just please. I mean, why, if you're a religious person, mm. if you care about your society, yes. shouldn't you be in there like a lot of the other religions are and do some good? The, the soul is rotting in this material world because of his forgetfulness of God. On the, the basis soul? of that forgetfulness, on the basis of that forgetfulness, he's accepting different miserable conditions. So rather than just alleviate that one condition, why not help him 
extricate himself once and for all from the material world. Can I just ask you a, a, a Krishna 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 Krishna. So you don't put any value on social no, action? No, I, I, so I, I didn't say we don't put any value. Can I, ask you what? Can, I just limitations. can I just ask you exactly what the soul is? The soul is, is, a, is a spiritual spark, part and parcel of the Supreme Soul, which is Krishna. The soul's original uh, place of uh, living is the spiritual world with Krishna. But because the soul has minute independence, he I falls do. down into this material world, or at least the tendency is there. I don't understand exactly what that is. I still don't understand. Mm. What is, what is I mean, Krishna is a person. Soul. You're talking about the soul. Yes. You've been saying that the soul is of utmost importance. Mm. But you have really put a lot of importance as well on the outside body, haven't you? Because you've made yourself different from any other person walking the street who actually practices a religion or has a certain culture. Mm. You stand out in a crowd, incredibly. So you have put a lot of importance on that outside shell, haven't you? And yet you're saying that the soul is the most important thing of all. No, but we don't cater to the demands of the body. How so you do don't you live in houses? Let me or explain well, what that can means. I just, can I just ask you one thing? What do you think are the other necessities for life? What do you have to have to survive? One needs a little food. Yeah. One needs some shelter. Shelter? What sort of shelter? Are you willing to be in the wilderness with a cardboard box? If necessary. What sort of shelter do you have? And uh, presently, I'm living uh, in the Brahmacharya Ashram at Sarah Street. I sleep on the floor. There are seven others in our room. And is this place heated? My belongings are kept in two bags. Fine. Is this place heated? It's sufficiently heated. What about the place in Watford? I think it's Letchworth Heath or whatever. Heath. What's that place? I don't understand what that That's is. That's a manor house which was donated by George Harrison in 1973 for our society. I've been there. As a preaching center. And it seems very materialistic to me. It's beautiful. What do you it's mean gorgeous. by materialistic? Well, you I don't know. It's what do you mean about Mater yes. Material means that which we accept to be real with the false idea that I am this body. And spiritual means, in full knowledge, that which we do for the pleasure far, of Krishna. As far as I can see, you keep mentioning material needs just to say, cover up for anything that you have in life. For instance, the trainer that you've got on, the shelter that you've got, the heat that comes through. So all the things that you want, you've taken. And yet, when it comes to people asking you about what you think of the material world, you seem to say, oh, we don't want anything on the material world. We want the spiritual self. We can sit there in a room on the floor without a bed. One has this material body. But you body. are using those material we possessions. Have, How can you say you're not? We have this material body and therefore we have a certain duty to maintain the body but one doesn't have to spend 24 hours a day maintaining the body but no one does nobody's no. got the time in this life to do that mm. so with but, those but bare so, necessities so the average life that most that most people live is what they get up having had generally too much sleep they they immediately uh, again splash themselves you're talking some about somebody who's got all the time in the world whereabouts do you work do you have any other responsibilities? Are you married? No, I'm not married. So well, how can a normal person who's living in this world say, I'd like to follow Krishna. I'll give up everything else. I don't want to know anything about material but possessions. A, man, a working man who's got children, how does he give yeah. up his... How can you cope? How, how can he be one realistic? The needs of his children? Just be one, realistic. One has a certain duty to his body, but he doesn't have to spend 24 hours a day. So. Everything belongs to Krishna. If one takes what he needs to maintain his family out of life... But don't you think Krishna would like you to live with a family and having the things that he's actually offered you on this earth in, with, every, you know, with all, every convenience? This world is a prison house, so there may be Why? some facilities Why here, is but the idea isn't, isn't to remain comfortable here. The idea is to get out. We haven't a position for the How do Krishna family? followers believe in reincarnation? Now, what's that mean? Could you just Literally, explain? transmigration of the soul. Transmigration. Mm. The, 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 Can you explain that? This, yeah, I explain. This, the soul is residing presently within a temporary material form. This form goes through various changes, birth, growth, mm, maintenance for some time, producing some byproducts, dwindling and dying. So at the time of death, that simply means that he gives up this old body and accepts a new one. He just so basically, you live many lives. Is that yeah. what it is? There's a cycle of repeated birth and death. There's eight million four hundred thousand species with different here? types of sense organs. Have you, have you been so here? Here? And what I'm hearing from you for the last five minutes is an Indian myth, which is a very lovely, beautiful you, Indian myth. You say it's a myth. It seems to me there's no. You've given no reasons why you believe any of this. You've given no sort of arguments why we should accept any of this. I mean, it's just like you're telling us a story. You know, it, it's a very lovely story, and I. I I, the, the, the Hare Krishna lifestyles does seem to be a very aesthetically beautiful lifestyle. So? But, um, 
It, looks it, like I, it doesn't make any sense to me with a rational mind. It doesn't, I just can't understand it mm. rationally. And I, I'm not prepared, frankly, to deny my rationality. And it seems, and I get the impression that some, some of your people do. Yeah, you seem, we seem to be being told to uh, stop thinking and just get on with no, it. No, we didn't say stop thinking. It almost well, sounds. Like, like, could you answer that Let's point? have an answer. Could you answer that, that, that what, what are you actually asking me to answer at this point? Well, why is it that um, you don't, you're not giving us any rational arguments? I'm giving rational arguments. To us, but but whether or not to us at the moment, it just sounds like you're chanting. When you chant, you just chant. You keep saying the same things. Have you tried it's, the chanting? I haven't tried it myself, but I've heard you mm. actually chant. Mm. And so that's how it sounds to us for the last 10, 15 minutes. That's what you've been doing, just saying the same things. It's almost as if you're brainwashed not to tell us anything else. You're going straight along that path, and we don't know anything else that's going on. It's chanting. What do you get out of that? For example, explain to I, I would personally be very okay. suspicious to take up the chanting because I, it, it, I'm suspicious that it would have that kind of lulling effect on mm. my mind. Mm. That it would dull my ability to ask questions and to, and to think clearly. But the devotees actually ask the most questions about life. How do you teach your children? People aren't questioning when they're being taught things at school. And the people aren't questioning where do you get this information from. Because it suits what they want to hear. About that. I'm because about it suits me. what they want to hear. People want to cater to the demands of the body because that's cheap and easy. Aren't you generalizing so about people? just like there's so many kinds of spiritual life that cater to what people want to hear. Yeah. So, so Krishna consciousness, we're not trying to cater to necessarily what the conditioned soul wants to hear, but we're trying to awaken within the sincere living entity the desire for spiritual success. Or you're trying to turn everyone into the same kind of person. No. And when you There's say, more variety you don't in say spiritual I. life. You never everyone say I. You everyone say in we. the material world thinks himself the center of everything. I, me, mine. Right? Yeah. And basically, whatever variety there may be is all around that same theme. Now, in the spiritual world, it's different. Everyone wants to become the humble servant of Krishna. And the competition is, the competition is how to become the servant the most removed from Krishna. How to serve his devotees first. And there is much more variety within it.